You know, MIT had done open courseware uh, almost 20 years ago in 2000. And my course was an MIT courseware. And so uh, MIT had pioneered, you know, putting course materials online. And then, you know, I was seeing technology advance so much and uh, technology being applied to almost every aspect of humanity, but digital technology wasn't being applied to education. And so to me, the challenge was labs were going to be very hard. How do we do labs? So in 2003, I launched a, one of the first circuits labs at MIT. It was called WebSim. So even today you can Google WebSim MIT, you'll go to my website. And I built that lab myself. It was well before MOOCs. It was the first MOOC lab. And on the average day, 300, 400 people would come in and do a free, a set of free circuits laboratories. And that gave me confidence that, you know, this can actually work. That people from all over the world can actually not only learn like with open courseware, with course materials, but we can also do interactive labs. And this gave us the confidence. And then in um, late 2011, when MIT and Harvard began to get together to think about launching an online learning platform, I was so enthusiastic to be part of it and to launch a nonprofit approach to online education and to build a platform with simulation and, and all of these technologies. In fact, the first course on edX was uh, the circuits course my colleague and I taught. And we had a circuits lab inspired by the circuits lab that I had built in 2003. So that's how I kind of got into it, somewhat by accident. Today on edX, we have 150 of the world's best institutions on our platform, including your own Tech de Monterey. We have uh, Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, Oxford, Cambridge, some of the top universities in the world and, and top companies like uh, IDB and nonprofits like, you know, and, and, and companies like IBM and, and uh, Red Hat and Microsoft and Linux Foundation all offering courses. We have uh, almost 25 million students on the platform from 196 countries, which is every single country in the world. And these 25 million students have taken 80 million courses on the platform. We have more than 3,000 courses on the platform today. We have almost 60 micro master's programs. We have more than 100 professional certificate programs. We launched a Spanish platform. Today we have 300 courses in Spanish on our platform and we have more than 3 million learners on our Spanish platform. And so we think of edX as a particle accelerator for learning. We're gathering all of this incredibly rich learning data and we're learning so much about learning. Uh, we make available all the data to our partner institutions. We have something called RDX, Research Data Exchange, where universities that opt in can share the data or research data for research purposes, which is very radical. Uh, just as one example, something radical that we learned did you realize that in 2012, edX discovered through this research data that six minute videos were ideal. We had a researcher at edX, Philip Guo, and he analyzed five million video viewing sessions on a number of courses in edX. And he plotted student engagement versus video length. And he found that six minute videos were the optimal size. Six minutes. Six minutes. And today, everybody quotes six, seven minute videos are optimal, and that came from an edX study done in 2012. So that is just one example of what we can do with this big data of learning. And we can look at millions of viewing sessions and from there derive insights into how students are learning. And this was a finding from researchers who analyzed data and learning patterns uh, from um, uh, MIT. This was Lori Breslau at MIT, who you may know. When you come to campus, on campus you go watch a lecture, and then they give you problems to work out. So you learn something, you hear something, and then they ask you to apply the learning in a problem. Also on edX, not surprisingly, when we looked at all the material is available, the problems, videos are all available to students all the time. So what we found is that generally, 
70% of the students start learning with the video. And, and then they go and do the problems. 70% of the students start by learning with the video. But if you look at towards the end of a course, only 30% of the students are starting with the video. Towards the end of the course, it flips, completely flips. 70% of the students start to answer the homework and problem sets. And depending on where they don't understand the question, they go and watch a video. So students, their learning is much more inspired when you give them a problem to solve and then ask them to go and watch a video to learn. It's a much better way of teaching when you give them a problem. They get motivated to learn and then they go and learn. So this completely, this was a very interesting result that showed that when students were given both problems and videos, because they're used to watching videos first, they started watching videos first, 70% started watching videos first. But over time, 70% then began to answer the problem first. And on the edX platform, we gather all this data, so we know what students are learning, when they're doing it, we know everything. It's very difficult to apply 18th century metrics to 21st century technologies. For example, when you go to a movie, if you leave the movie, you pay $10 and you go for a two hour movie, and you leave the movie halfway, that is not good. So you can say the goodness of a movie is completion rate. How many people went in? How many people stayed till the end of the movie? That is a good metric for a movie. But today everybody watches five minute YouTube videos. Is completion rate a good metric for YouTube videos where it's free, it's easy, you're watching a YouTube video while you're on the train. How many people do you know that watch every YouTube video to the end? I must have watched, I don't know, hundreds of YouTube videos. I haven't watched a single YouTube video to the end. So we cannot apply the same metric that we applied to movies in a theater for which we paid 10 bucks to YouTube videos. So the two are different things. It's like applying 18th century metrics to 21st century innovations. Similarly, I don't think we can apply the same kind of completion metric to MOOCs because you can start for free. You can't apply completion metrics from the 18th century to a product which is free, which you can just, with a click, you can start doing it. Instead, a better metric for MOOCs is the completion rate for people that have signed up for a certificate. So once you've signed up for a certificate, then you're saying, yes, I want to complete it. I'm interested in completing it. You have skin in the game because you're paying. You have skin in the game, you're paying, you have, uh, and it, it could be a small amount of money. It could be $25 or $50 for a certificate, and you have signaled a seriousness to complete it. Now it's fair to measure completion rate. Because when you come to a university, you paid university tuition. You go to uh, the Ivy League universities, you're paying tuition of $45,000 a year. So of course you're going to complete a course. Each course costs you $6,000. If you paid $6,000, you're not going to walk out in the course in five minutes, you're going to complete the course. And so similarly with MOOCs, I think the way completion rate should be measured is the percentage of people that pass of those that have signed up for a verified certificate. And on edX, that percentage is about 60%. For people that sign up for a verified certificate, 60% of them pass. And these are hard courses. These are not, you know, you, if you take the circuits course that I teach, it's an it's, it's, it's a MIT hard course. It's probably one of the hardest courses at MIT. The, uh, these micro-credentials, the micro-masters in particular, has two values. One is it is a valuable standalone credential. But imagine you get a micro-masters from uh, IGADA at uh, Monterey Tech in entrepreneurship. Monterey Tech is one of the top universities in the world for entrepreneurship. That means something. You get a micro-masters from MIT in uh, manuf uh, manufacturing from MIT, that is of value in and of itself. At the same time, if you do well in the MicroMasters, you can apply for the master's degree 
and get admitted into a master's. And so it gives you a pathway to a master's. So there's two sets of values. And on edX, 70% of the students are interested only in the micro masters. But 30% of the students are interested in following up and continuing for a master's degree. So we take surveys of uh, learners who are completing MicroMasters. And of the surveys we've done of learners who completed MicroMasters, we do the surveys three months after they complete. And we keep doing surveys all along, but three months after they complete, we are finding that learners tell us that 87% of them have had a career advancement. 87% have had a career advancement within three months. What is a career advancement? A pay raise? a promotion, a new job. So this is a big deal. This is what learners are telling us. Now with companies, we need to, as companies hire more and more and see more and more progression from MicroMasters learners, we believe that companies will also begin to recognize MicroMasters. And we are seeing this already. Uh, the company in India, Tech Mahindra, one of India's top three software companies, I guarantee an interview to anybody from India that completes one of 10 MicroMasters. They have to complete one, and they have listed 10 MicroMasters. They will guarantee them an interview. Similarly, in the US, GE will guarantee an interview to anybody from Massachusetts who has completed uh, a MicroMasters in supply chain management, in AI, uh, and uh, cybersecurity, and one other subject. So companies, more and more companies are now asking their employees to do MicroMasters. Many of them are now beginning to guarantee interviews to MicroMasters learners. So we are hoping that this will keep building up as we get more and more students who are completing MicroMasters and go to companies and uh, make their impact known. From the very first day, when people say that the pedagogy of edX is container put knowledge in, they have not taken any edX courses. The very first edX course, and any course we do on edX is based on active learning, where we, we invented this concept called a learning sequence. So on edX you see a learning sequence where videos are interleaved with assessments. And in the learning sequence, you show a video and then you ask a question. Maybe you ask the students to go to the discussion forum, discuss something. So transmission of knowledge and questions are interleaved. And that creates, so the basic pedagogy of the platform is active learning. More recently, we've advanced much more. Three years ago, we introduced peer instruction into edX. You know, Eric Mazu wrote the book on peer instruction. So now we have a peer instruction uh, uh, pedagogical block on edX where you can teach something, you can ask students to submit uh, answers, you can take a poll of the students, you can do a cold call, you can ask a student a quick question, and then you can ask the students to discuss, and then you can ask the students to resubmit their answer. It's peer instruction. So we can do that uh, today, and a lot of courses are doing that. But my dream is to really create a very modular education system where at the undergraduate level or graduate level, learners can take these modular credentials, like micro bachelors at the undergraduate level or micro masters at the graduate level, where learners will be able to take these credentials like Lego blocks. They will be able to take them and then stack them up to full degrees. I believe they will also be able to take micro bachelors and micro masters from multiple universities and create a truly networked model of education where they will get degrees from universities, of course, but these modules might come from different universities and they will synthesize their own degrees and complete degrees. It'll be very low cost and anybody and everybody will have access to this kind of education. A truly modular networked education environment. You can, it's completely flexible, you can uh, tune it to your personal needs and you can also be a lifelong learner. You can say, Look, I won't learn a bachelor, I won't earn a bachelor's degree in the first four years. You know what? I will learn for one and a half years and will get three or four micro bachelors. And then you know what? I want to go and work at that company. And while I'm working, I'll keep learning. I think you said just in time learning. 
I'll keep learning just in time and I'll keep accumulating micro bachelors over my career. And maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years later, I will get a bachelor's degree. And you know what? Maybe in 20 or 30 years, maybe bachelor's degrees won't be important anymore. People will just look for the competencies you're getting from these micro credentials and that's it. Once you're learning on the job and the micro and the bachelor's degree comes later, suddenly it's not important anymore.